Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordo. We are the founders of Lumia. And we're super passionate about all things coaching, and we want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training thousands of life coaches. Let's dive into the science and magic of coaching. On today's episode, we're going to talk about how coaching supports strong decision making. Noel, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? It seems like you're not uh, feeling that well today. I'm a little under the weather, yeah. but the good news is, um, is that brains still work even when yes. your body is feeling a little sick. Yes. So let's, uh, let's work our brains <laughs> with this episode. Um, I like the word strong. It comes out at me. Uh, we're not just talking about decision making, but we're talking about strong decision making. What do you mean by strong? Well, you know, when we're thinking about coaching, what coaching does, so many times we talk about the outcome set that we're going to accomplish our goals, whether mm -hmm. that's building stronger relationships, communicating more effectively, or changing something about ourselves or our lives. And these are wonderful things to talk about. But what we're not talking about that I think everybody needs to know, and the reason for our chat today, is that implicit in every single outcome that is positive is a good decision that was made along the way, a decision mm -hmm. that was made with data and right. intention. And that's what I, I mean by strong decision making. Yeah. Um, so I, I tend to, this is great for me because I tend to be uh, impulsive. I tend to be, um, you know, I don't, I'm not thorough. And so when it comes to making decisions, um, sometimes I look back and I was like, oh, I should have uh, put it through some kind of filter, some kind of strainer. That's where this comes in. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is, is really important. Do I have your permission to yes. uh, say, <laughs> tear me down? Yes, you do. Always. No, not tear you down, but, but really just kind of normalize what you just said and talk about the way that adults operate in our very complex world. So mm -hmm. what you're talking about is essentially limbic response that we take in billions and billions and billions of bits of information every second, but we can only process 44 cognitive conscious pieces of information at a time. Mm. And as adults, we're asked to make decisions. And we live in a culture in the United States of America where quickness is valued above slowness. So right. when that decision-making has to happen, we've all been socialized that we need to make a split decision. And what actually happens in adult human brains is that we are reacting instead of responding and driving our thought processes into our limbic system and making emotional, impulsive choices based on the way that we feel emotionally and the way that we perceive ourselves as relating to data. Yes. And that last point is really important. Because there's a, there's a big, huge difference between the way that we perceive ourselves relating to data and the way that we actually relate to data. What do you think the difference is? Oh, that's actually really good. So uh, the way that we're, we perceive, um, um, the way that we relate to data. So for me, when I think about perceive, I think about my lenses, my story, how I'm wired, you know, what activates me. Um, the way that I see a situation uh, is going to be different than, you know, or possibly different than the way someone else, you know, for example, you may see a situation and uh, that may just be, be because of um, how, you know, what we went through in our, our history. So um, yeah, I, I tend to pull or I, I'm more aware of it now, but I tend to pull more from um, emotion, which you mentioned, and that leads to a reaction and, not a response. So you're definitely someone who's more thorough. You take your beats, you know, especially when it comes to, um, you know, bigger uh, life decisions. Um, I have in the past um, made very impulsive decisions and then regretted it. And I think, um, yeah, like it just comes from, I think part of it is just my wiring. Well, you're right. It, you're absolutely right. That, that part of it is your wiring and that wiring is 
is part of all humans. So, you know, what you're describing, thinking about your emotions, thinking about your lived experience, thinking about your memory, about your past, that is 100% how most humans respond to things. And it's called the availability heuristic. And it's actually a form of bias that our brain knows that it can't take in all the data that we need to do to make decisions in the moment. And what you're experiencing with that impulsivity is an evolutionary response where the idea that I have to make a decision, I have to make a decision now comes because of survival instinct. Mm -hmm. And what actually happens is our brain takes a shortcut and goes back to memories, data that we already know, that we're already familiar with and cuts out any data that we might have access to, but is just not familiar to us. And so our brains actually set us up to miss out on the observation and processing of more data sets um, that we actually have access to. Yeah. So can we, um, I could think of a, a, a actual real life example that seems pretty simple, but can we apply how uh, running it through um, coaching can support a stronger decision? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, one of my, <laughs> one of my stresses recently has been my editor not emailing me back Um just due to what's on her plate and and who knows, right, where she's at, what she's going through, other books that she has launching. And so uh, I find myself getting very reactive, impatient, and then going to, you know, something's wrong, and then getting angry and all of that. So where would data fall into this where um, I could make uh, uh, smarter decisions instead of um, throwing rocks at her bedroom window and, you know, that kind of stuff? I mean, first of all, I'm impressed <laughs> that like that, that those are the action sets that you have in your repertoire right now. Um, you know, and, and listen, what you're describing is another facet of really human response. So, you know, a big part of coaching is when you come together with coach and client, that coach is going to hold up a mirror for you so that you can see and understand yourself. Mm. And what you're talking about here is, um, I'm aware that I'm telling myself a story And that I have needs and goals for myself that when it meets with reality, uh, aren't exactly working out to meet my expectations. Right. Right. And so if we're just kind of breaking this down and thinking about, all right, you know, what do coaches do? Coach and client come together to achieve a goal. So in this situation, the larger goal could be writing a book, having it published. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's an accurate goal state? Yes. Um, writing a book, getting it published, uh, you know, meeting the, 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 the deadlines, right. All the deadlines that, that you're expected to meet as a writer. Jumping through the hoops, right? So you're going through a really human process right. and at the starting line, um, what coach and client need to do is to examine the goal itself. Is it achievable? What are the blockers? Who are the stakeholders? What's the measurement? What's the timeline? You know, what's the access to resources? And then coach and clients set that agenda um, each and every session. So this would be probably an example of a mid-contract blocker Mm. where you're coming to the table and saying, my editor isn't getting back to me. This is driving me crazy. I'm having emotional responses to it. And you're really self-aware. And so you are able to pull out out of the gate And I'm telling myself a story. So let me ask you, what's the goal state here that you want to achieve? I um, want to feel heard as a writer (laughs) underneath this, but on the surface, what I want to achieve is uh, turning my book in time, uh, getting paid, and then for the book to be published. I mean, those are the, the three big things. Yeah. And so, so what you have on your hands here is we need to sit down as coach and client and, and take a look at the blockers and the stakeholders and, and how we're going to measure this thing. So, um, what I'm hearing, you know, at its core is that there is a stakeholder involved in, in your particular goal. Do I have that right? Right. Like a gatekeeper, like, 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 like a, a piece of this that I have no control over a piece of this that you have no control over. Absolutely. And so when we're looking at this, I'm going to ask you to dig down a little deeper and figure out, okay, if all of this is true, 
what's the actual goal here? Mm, what do you mean if all of this is true? If it is true that your goal is to have your book published in a timely manner, right. and there is a human right. that is a stakeholder and a blocker, mm -hmm. what is your true goal? Just to make my side of the bed or take responsibility of my, um, you know, my homework, what I'm obligated to do, uh, which is email, keep in touch, let let her know where I'm at. Um, I, I, I don't have any control of her hitting the ball back and when she does that. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to demo here. I'm going to, I'm going to pull the wool back. So dear reader, what you might be noticing is that John is describing only what he can see from the perspective of what this blocker looks like and how it can work. Mm -hmm. And when a coach comes into the equation, that coach can provide a secondary lens that John doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And I am not a stakeholder in John's life. So um, what I'm seeing here mm -hmm. is that um, there's a relationship that you might need to develop more effectively in order to get what you want. Sure. Have you given any thought to the relationship that you have with this editor and its health? Yes, the relationship is good, but it's also a new relationship as my other uh, editor has moved on um, to other things. And so that's part of this is learning to dance with someone new. Yeah. So I want to challenge you right there. If the relationship is a good one, what what do you think might be um, underneath all of all of this distress that you're experiencing and the inaction on the part of your editor? It's the emotional piece. It's um, stuff that's tied to my story. It's, uh, you know, um, the false belief that um, they may find out I'm not a real writer. It's insecurities, you know, stuff like that, that surface because the ball's not rolling. Okay. So <clears throat> what we have going on here is, is you have a, a bucket of um, emotions that, that you have attached to this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you also have a person in your life that you need to partner with in order to get things done. Have you ever had a conversation with your editor about um, the way that you relate to each other in terms of emotional impact and financial impact? No. Mm. That's interesting. So if you were to have a conversation like that, what do you think the possible outcomes could be? I think uh, me understanding that uh, she works differently, me understanding that it's not a personal thing, uh, me understanding that, um, you know, maybe she has her workload is tremendous right now. So, uh, yeah. So, like, instead of seeing it just through my lens and um, my my feelings, uh, pulling back and kind of the 360, right, uh, uh, empathy and the other person's story and where they're coming from. So you understand the whole situation, which which is actually data instead of me personalizing it, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'd like to, I'd like to ask your permission to add a different lens to this as well as a possible outcome. Mm -hmm. So another possible outcome of having a conversation with your editor around what you want the relationship between you to look like and feel like, and what this person wants that relationship to look like and feel like you might also be able to brainstorm and team up on some solutions mm -hmm. to calm your personal anxiety it might not be full communication, but might just be got your email. I'm slammed. Here's the timeline you can expect from me. Right. And I think because I'm not getting that, I jump to conclusions. I panic, I get emotional. And, you know, the, 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 the house of cards <laughs> comes crumbling down. Yeah. So I want to unpack what just happened in this conversation. So I was demonstrating coaching and applying it to John. And what was going on there is as coach and client, we were examining the blockers, the stakeholders, the measurement, possible outcomes that, that John hadn't seen. And what I know well was able to see was at, at the core, um, there's a relationship between two people that's not functioning. And what's happening in that that dysfunctionality is emotions from John that's leading to reactivity. And adults rarely take time to sit down and strategize like this from a 360 
perspective. Adults typically take their emotions as fact and then plow forward. So if John had not taken the space to apply this to a coaching conversation, you'd be left with the emotional hangover of, you know, it's like, it's like dating, right? And somebody's not texting you back and you're like, oh my God, am I getting ghosted? You know, yeah. right? So so this is this is pushing on your limbic and reptilian brain and causing these deep emotional drives. Now, I seriously doubt that your editor wants you to feel that way. In fact, your editor probably wants you to feel great because the better you feel, the more you're going to write and the more money everybody's going to make. And so from a streamlined approach to productivity, Person A and person B need to come together to figure out how we're going to correct the emotional situation in the relationship between us, right? Yeah. Um, so that's part one of decision-making is really getting to the goal state, unpacking it, and perhaps having an alternative lens. Because what I noticed that you were doing, John, is you were putting it all on you of like, I have to change. I have to change everything. And you weren't thinking about what would it be like for me to ask for support? Right. Yeah. I mean, it becomes um, a kind of inner uh, conversation, inner fight, inner struggle. And then you kind of start to feel more alone, which then amplifies your emotions and frustrations and anger and all that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So on, I'm going to use a scaling question. On, on a scale of one to 10, how willing do you feel to email your editor, communicate with your editor in some way and say, Hey, um, I'd like to create time for us to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to talk about, you know, the impact of the relationship that we have with each other on each other. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, what was the question and what was, what's the scale that I would do that? Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, how ready do you feel? Oh, I, I, uh, nine. A, a nine. I think this is important, especially if you want to have a, a good, healthy, productive relationship with, uh, yeah, your partner, this, your editor. This is a nine. So, you know, very quickly, we were able to move the problem of I don't like the way I feel and drill it down to the actual goal of I, I'd like to move, um, turn the dial inside of this relationship because there's an outside strategy taking place with a coach. And then the scaling question is used to determine client readiness. Mm. Yeah. And so once, once you take that action step, what we would do as coach and client is evaluate it. How did it go? Mm -hmm. How did it feel? Right. Is this a step that needs to be repeated or is there more to learn? Are there additional things to do? And um, what I would want to do as coach is also source your readiness to see if you would want to game plan and role play and actually go into that conversation with your editor with talking points all queued up so that you're not shooting from the hip when you get in there. Yeah, I love what you just said. I do that a lot with my clients. And it's so important to actually in the room in the coaching session to practice to do the role playing. Uh, and it may so it may feel kind of weird and scary. Um, but it's so helpful because the coach can um, walk you through the the actual instead of just saying, go do this, you could practice uh, with and on your coach. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, Let's bring this back to decision making, because this is a, a behavioral facet that isn't given enough attention. Mm -hmm. Just in the everyday rigmarole of going through your life, what you do, what you say, how you act, how you behave is going to have tremendous impact on the way other people relate to you and how effective you're able to be in the world. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is creating space to analyze your own behavior, your own intention, and to hypothesize about potential impact on your life, on your world. This is what adulting looks like. And adulting is so hard, Noel. <laughs> <laughs> it is what adulting looks like. And it is so hard. And it's also why having partnership in this is really important. And 
I can't emphasize enough that there is no situation, um, interpersonal, relational, strategic, that is too small to Mm -hmm. apply this kind of 360 application to. I do this personally in my own practice a lot in dating because- you know, what you're describing those, that like tornado of feelings that sits on the other side of like actual communication Mm -hmm. is vast. Yeah. And also, you know, they say, uh, uh, especially with children, um, it's better to be yelled at than to be ignored. It's the, it's the ignored part that activates, um, the inner, uh, you know, um, 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 am I worthy? Uh, the, you know, the whole rejection and then um, internalizing things. And that's, that's usually what's difficult. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. And I, and, and then for the sake of time, I, I will tell you how this played out. Um, but uh, I think with this specific example, because uh, of my own insecurities as a writer um, and have been, you know, rejected, I think the panic is, instead of trusting that, you know, contracts were signed and things are going to play out and there will be a return and your book will be pub- published, um, having doubt in self because someone didn't text you in the time that you wanted her to, that um, it deletes, you know, your, 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 where you're at, your career, how much you've worked. It like deletes the whole thing. And so that's, that's the whole, in my head, jumping to conclusions, uh, c- catastrophizing. Yes. Yes. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate the complete value of coaching right now. So John, I want to ask your permission to levy an observation. Yes. (laughs) What's missing in that entire equation is your own agency to manipulate the situation and foster better relationships where you don't have to be left hanging. You Mm -hmm. have a voice, Mm -hmm. you have fingers, and you can ask questions. Right. Like you mean, uh, uh, standing up for yourself in a way, standing up for yourself or, or getting together with your editor and saying, listen, I impact your life. You impact mine. When I don't hear from you, here's what happens for me emotionally. And this is how it impacts my work. If you can send up a flare, a flag, anything, it will help me be better at my job, which will help you be better at your job. What do you think? Can you do that for me? Right. Right. And, um, so hard to do. Uh, I know many people struggle with this and we're using this example uh, with career, but especially in personal relationships, um, asking for what you need, what you want, what you deserve, that kind of stuff uh, is, is, is difficult, but it's also a practice, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, finally, I, you know, I think one of the the major aspects of coaching that that we're seeing here, you know, in this specific example is the process of listening deeply and mirroring back to the client, both what the coach heard and what the coach didn't hear. So when John was talking, John was talking all about how he feels. This is where I'm at. And, and, you know, I, I use this term very lightly in terms of kind of a, a victim mentality of my life is happening to me. Mm -hmm. And what I honed in on really specifically as a trained coach is where is your agency? What is the action that you can take to turn the dial from my life happening to me to towards me happening to my life? Mm -hmm. And that is a major shift. And so if you are my client in session, I would bring that up probably repeatedly to the end of time at every single point where you need to make a decision, John, are you letting your life happen to you or are you happening to your life? What do we need to do here to turn that dial? Right. To get the power back. To get the power back. And then we analyze all the different data sets. We game plan. And then I put the ball in your court to say, well, what feels comfortable to you? How do you want to proceed? And then how will we know if it's effective? So how about we, we take a look there to kind of close this out. So given that, that your readiness to act in this situation is pretty high, it's at a nine, Mm -hmm. how will we know if you've been effective in having this conversation? If I actually do it. Well, that's, that's one, that's, I'd say that's part, part one. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, okay, okay, dear listener, what we're observing is that John's not actually ready <laughs> to have that conversation because you gave me a nine and then just threw major doubt that it was actually going to happen. So what's going on there? No, it, uh, I will do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so the ending to my little story saga is uh, 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 after a week, she did finally contact me and she said she was in New York launching uh, Viola Davis's book for the last you know three weeks and and all that. So that's data I did not have, um, which then, of course, eased, eased my um, panic. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear that. I hear that. So like, you know, pulling the lens back on decision making, you know, what we're talking about for you, and I swear this is the exact same conversation I have in, in all of my dating coaching clients is you have a lot of control over what happens in that in-between space. You have a lot of control over what happens in the in-between space of sending a message and receiving a response. And if that three-week time period is too long, if that is unacceptable to you, again, what you're missing in this equation is your agency. Mm -hmm. And so how do you need to turn your decision-making dial in terms of self-talk, action, speaking up, and partnering with others to get your needs met? Because that's the bottom line here is in this particular relationship, your needs aren't being met and yours a partnership here. Man, listen to the certainty of Noelle's voice. I love that how she brought it home. I feel like you really um, at the end punched it, which is great. And uh, also bringing it back to you is also what Noelle is doing, you know, bringing it back to you. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I love it. That was, there was a little uh, mini journey there. Oh, Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, when I was asking you, how will we know if this is effective? What I'm thinking about are are two different measures that moving forward, you'll be able to evaluate the way that you feel in terms of engaging with this editor. And moving forward, you'll have um, some specific data on whether this editor can hear you and actually honor your socio-emotional needs for any kind of response to indicate life on the other end so that your limbic system can calm. Yeah. Trust is built. Mm -hmm. sure. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you. All right, my uh, friend, good luck to you. Uh, thank you so much for coaching me this morning. And if you're listening, <laughs> uh, you know, this is coaching, this is coaching in real time. So hope that was helpful for you and you learned uh, how coaching can support strong decision-making. Thank you. Awesome. For Have a great one. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to lumiacoaching.com slash everything. Explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose, and a bold community to do it with. Lumia is ready to equip you with the tools, training, and community you will need to reach your goals. If you're ready to build a unique coaching business on your own terms while making an impact on the world at large, Lumia is the next bold step in your coaching journey. That's lumiacoaching.com slash everything. And hey, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it. <laughs>